Smoke, Paul Catalina, and Craig Smoke. I've known Dale Hansen for a quite some time back in the early 80s and eventually really got to know him in the late 19, 1988 when I did a story about a young boy from Marshall, Jamie, who had leukemia and died soon after Marshall lost to Dallas Carter that controversial year. Uh, and Dale ran the story on Sunday Special, which is as good a Sunday show that has ever been produced, directed, anchored, or whoever else in all of television around the country. And Dale Hansen joins us now. He's announced his retirement after 50 years. 50 years. And you were fired back in uh, early on in Iowa, weren't you? Was No, you were fired. How many times were you fired, Dale? Oh, my goodness. Uh, counting the pre-broadcasting uh, jobs, I, I've had 11 what I consider full-time jobs. Um, I, I've had 11 full-time jobs. And I was, I, I've been fired from eight of them. <laughs> and I was fired. Uh, I was fired in in, uh, in Knoxville, Iowa. Then I went to St. Cloud, Minnesota. I was fired. I went to Coil Radio in Omaha. I was fired. I went to KMTV in Omaha, Nebraska. I was fired. I came to KDFW in Dallas. I was fired. And then I've been at WFAA uh, ever since. It, I, I guess it took me a little while to grow up. Maybe I don't know, but uh, I, I didn't. I didn't think I'd finish out my run at uh, Channel Eight. Quite honestly. 50 years. Uh, I don't even know where to start, but uh, <laughs> I don't I don't know where to finish. Yeah, I, 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 uh, well, let me ask you this. Uh, obviously, you have never been afraid of having an opinion about something. You've never been afraid to write no. things that matter to you in your heart or your soul. Are yeah. you misunderstood in any way? Well, I think so. Um, I, I think so in many ways. Um, I, I think the people who know me best know that that I don't quite um, uh, I don't quite match up to the image that a lot of people have of me. Uh, uh, although, as I do say, you know, most, most people say I'm this arrogant, egotistical jerk, and uh, I, I don't think I am. And maybe maybe the reason I don't think I am is because I'm so arrogant and egotistical. I don't know that I am. Uh, you know. That, but I, I think there's a there's a softer side to me, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you you certainly would agree with this. But uh, I think there is a softer side to me. There's a more generous side of me, um, uh, a more compassionate side of me than that some people I think have taken from my uh, uh, from my uh, positions that I take on sports. Uh, uh, I'm an equal opportunity offender. I, I even got a couple of emails just yesterday. They said it's about time we got your racist. But off the air, um, and I, I, I still have people calling me a racist, and, and, and apparently it started years ago because uh, I dared criticize uh, the black athlete. And as I said then, and I stand by it, I, I'm an equal opportunity offender. I I do try as best I can to uh, to describe what I see and what I believe, and um, you know, every so often, I apparently I criticize somebody that but somebody thinks i shouldn't and uh, i don't shy away from that um but at the end of the day the bottom line is i i know who i am i i, I know uh i i think what happens is a lot of people a lot of people think that i am this arrogant egotistical jerk primarily because i'm very comfortable in my skin i uh, i have mirrors in my house I, I i know how much skin i have i know how bad i look but I, I decided a long time ago that, you know, I really am one of the luckiest guys walking the earth. Uh, I accept it. I, I, I enjoy my life. I love my life. And I think, unfortunately, that somehow rubs a lot of people the wrong way. Dale, if I had told you 50 years ago that one day you were probably going to have to sit in a meeting and answer a lot of questions that people had criticized you on Twitter or that the most popular, more highly funded sports show nationally was two dudes yelling at each other across a desk. What would you have said then compared to where the business has gone now? Well, well, I certainly wouldn't have known about Twitter. I, I hope you can still hear me. My, somebody just knocked at the door and the, my dogs are going nuts here. Um, but no, I, the, the business has changed a great deal. And, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons that I decided to decide for me to retire. But I'm not into Twitter. I, I don't. I don't like Facebook. I don't. I don't even enjoy doing things digitally. Although it, it's that digital internet system or whatever you call it that basically kind of took me to another level a few years ago. Um, uh, when my work did start showing up on on YouTube and Reddit and all these different uh, platforms, 
but I don't enjoy that. I, I, I'm, I'm still old school. I, I like I like the ten o'clock sportscast. I like a camera in front of me. I like having anchors around me, and um, I, I just never bought into the to, to Twitter, and Facebook, and all these other things. And and I think that's unfair to the station. I, I think it's unfair to the station. I think it's unfair to to the people around me. And I, quite honestly, I think it's unfair to me. Uh, I, I, I've told people several times that I, I think if I was 35 right now, I think I'd own Twitter. I think I, I think I would embrace it. I think I would figure it out. I think I would be all over Facebook, uh, you know, whatever, all that kind of stuff. But at this point in my life, uh, no, I'm not interested. And 50 years ago, I, I would have never imagined that, um, that we would fill up most of our days, uh, like you say, with two guys across the desk hollering at one another, uh, spouting, which I don't believe uh, they believe, arguments most of the time. That, that's what really offends me. I, I think we have too many people, especially in sports, but it's, I think it's true news and everything. We have too many people who go for what do they call it, the clicks or the fades mm. or the, you know, and they don't believe some of this stuff, but I know for a fact, that some of them don't believe some of the stuff they say. And that, you know, they make a nice check for doing it. I, I get that. I don't think I would ever allow myself to be that person. Um, and I don't think I've ever been that person. Uh, but yeah, in, in that regard, the business drives me absolutely nuts. It really does. Dale, uh, what do you remember of hearing or uh, hearing about or seeing Jamie's season, the story from uh, Smokey oh for gosh, the very yeah. first time, and, and just your first interactions with Smokey uh, all that time ago? Well, I, I, I'm glad you brought me back to that because I wanted to say it when, when you were talking about, about it in, in setting up uh, the interview here. Uh, that, that's still, to this day, one of the most powerful and, and best stories uh, that we've ever run. My favorite part of that is David calls me and says, I've got this story that I think uh, you'd like, and I think it would be even better if I could get the exposure of it, you know, on your station. And then he tells me it's like five and a half minutes long. And, uh, and in those days, I mean, that, that's, that's just, well, even today, uh, but that's, that's a crazy amount of time, you know, for, for any one story. So, I said, I said, well, David, I'll, I'll take a look at it. But I said, I'll probably have to edit it down a little bit. And, and they said, no, no, I trust you. You know, whatever you think you need to do. And then I'm thinking, I mean, this is going to sound harsh, but David knows me well. I, I'm thinking, okay, this is, a, this is something that he did in Tyler. Uh, yeah, we'll clean that up. We'll fix it up. We'll make it next. There's only been two pieces. Now, I've only been doing this for 50 years. There's only been two pieces that I've ever had presented to me that I did not change, that I did not want to change, that I did not have at least some suggestion of how I could make it better. There's only been two. One of them was, thank God for kids, that David Handler and Lee Gonzalez uh, put together. And I came in the next day when they had finished it up, and they said, you can change whatever you want. And I'm feeling horrible because I know I'm going to have to change something. I, that's just who I am. And they ran, thank God for kids. And I said, uh, that's perfect. And I've never touched it since. David sends me the Jamie story, and I'll never forget this. We're in the Channel 8 uh, offices, and Jerry Orr was sitting there. And I said, look at this. And I told him, I said, it's five and a half minutes long. Uh, give me your thoughts on it, and then we'll figure out how to fix it. Orr starts crying. Now, I cry when Grandpa got gets sick on the Waltons. So me, cry, I mean, I cried at the at the Judd's farewell concert. So, so for me to for me to tear up, that's not that's not the biggest uh, the biggest standard. Or turns around and he's got tears running down his cheeks, and he looks at me and he said, "I think it's perfect." And I said, "I I know it's perfect." And I said, "I I, I can't believe it. I can't believe it." And it wasn't a reflection on David as much as it was the, on the fact that, well, I fix everything. I have to have my fingerprints on everything. And that incredible story, incredible story, is one of only two things in my life that had presented to me. And I just looked at it and said, there's nothing, nothing that needs to be changed or fixed on that. It was it's still one of the most remarkable stories I ever had the honor and the pleasure of, uh, of introducing, uh, uh, on any, on any 
uh, show that I've ever done. And then David goes to Austin and picks up all the awards for that. And we're sitting at a bar. We're, we're, we're sitting at a bar in Austin. I said, you know, I think it was my introduction. To Satan. <laughs> How about the day I called you? You're going to run it. And I called you and told you that Jamie had oh. passed away. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, my gosh. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, uh, oh, that, that, yeah. So, yeah, it was, it was, oh, man, I'm getting chills just thinking about it. Uh, yeah, I'm going to run this great story. And then, yeah, and then I get the call. Oh, by the way, I thought you wanted to know, you needed to know, you know, he died. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And, uh, and I came out after the story. We ran the story. And then I came out at the end. And, and um, I said, Jamie died this morning. And uh, I mean, the phone calls and the letters. This is what's funny to me. Uh, and I, I think I've told Smokey this. I'm, I'm sure I have. If not, he can hear it now for the first time. But the number of letters, uh, we didn't even have like Twitter stuff back then. But the number of letters and calls that I got, like, oh, my gosh, Dale, you're the greatest. You're the greatest, Dale. What a great story, Dale. That's why I watch you, Dale. And I'm like, well, yeah, yeah. I was on for like 12 seconds, <laughs> uh, you know. Yeah. And it was yeah. like Ted Madden, Ted Madden, and uh, uh, you know, I, I, you know, Ted Madden did stories like that. Jerry Orr did great stories. Tony Martinez, one of the most gifted writers I've ever known in my life, and and they would always get like, what the heck, you know? And I, I would forward them, you know, the letters or the emails or whatever. And they're like, oh, man, Dale, that story you did last night was unbelievable. I'm like, I'd forward it to Ted Madden. And he goes, why are they writing you? Why are they saying, you know, I said, well, that's the advantage of being the big fat faced anchor sitting there. You know, I, I, I get, but it is, a, it is a double edged sword. And I believe this. I, I, I get and have gotten a great deal of credit, uh, for, for stories and, and, and a broadcast that I really didn't deserve. I mean, I, I, I didn't play that big a role in that. I really didn't. At the same time, uh, you know, I also get a great deal of criticism and a great deal of blame for um, some of the stories that I really didn't have a big part in. You know, that, I, that I, it wasn't my decision. It wasn't, um, it wasn't necessarily how I would have done something or whatever. Uh, that, that, it, that I figured out, though, fortunately, a long time ago, that it, it does cut both ways, and it just, it just comes with the territory. But that story will always, uh, will always uh, live with me as at least as long as I'm able to remember anything at all, yeah. I will remember Jamie. I promise you I will. So. Thank you, Craig, for bringing it up. And Dale, always for what you've told me. So you come back after this long delay of doing the show forever at your house in Waxahachie. Why do you and why did they sit you on a cocktail table that looks about the size <laughs> of a leg? Uh, excuse me. I think they wanted, to, they wanted me to feel as comfortable as I possibly could. Uh, and they know having me next to a bar table would probably be my most appropriate <laughs> position. <Yeah. laughs> no, I, again, they, it, it, it is a bit of a contradiction, uh, I think, and a lot of us think. Uh, but but we're all trying to figure this out. I mean, everybody from the president of the United States on down is trying to figure out the pandemic and, and the COVID protocols and the like. And they wanted me back in the studio so that we could have some, some human uh, contact and exchanges. But then they decided uh, that they wanted to, to keep us separated. And, um, and I, I thought it was kind of funny myself. I don't know if you saw the first night I did. I said, I said, wait a minute, what is this? You know, you're all standing behind these really fancy glass and wood framed and chrome desk. And I get a cocktail table and it's a deli. It's a wobbly cocktail table. And, um, but no, I I, I actually kind of like it over there. I think I think if I could get a wider shot that thins me out just a little bit, uh, <laughs> when I'm standing by the set, I look like I'm six foot ten and I weigh about four hundred pounds. And well, I okay, I weigh about four hundred pounds, but I'm not six foot ten. Um, so no, I, I I'm fine with it. But it, again, it's just trying to practice uh, some 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 safety uh, protocols and and uh, to, to make sure that we do kind of remind the audience that. Um, yeah, the pandemic's over. Dale's back in the studio, but it's not completely over. And we still have to exercise some caution. And uh, uh, so I stand by the glass, by the cocktail table, as you point out. 
Dale, do you think that the days of, especially in a market the size of Dallas, of somebody having your job or, or even like Pete Delkis, uh, a job like that, as long as they do, are waning because of the way that, that, that it works? That, like you're not going to know your weatherman or your sports guy or your anchor for 25 years anymore? Oh, no, I think you're going to know Pete Delkis for 25 to 35 years. Uh, I mean, I really do. And uh, um, no, I mean, well, I, I mean, it, and I don't mean this again, as arrogant as it sounds, but there's, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of people who have done sports in any market for 35, uh, 40 years, um, ever. I mean, it, it's, it's not, it, that's not really the way this business usually works. Um, it is changing, but I still think, certainly in Dallas, I think there'll always be a need, of, uh, you know, for a sportscaster. I think the weather guys are becoming increasingly uh, more important as the weather changes and becomes more severe. And I do think uh, there'll always be uh, a 10 o'clock uh, uh, newscast. I, it, it may start to present itself in a different form. It, it may start to become a little bit more digitally uh, uh, presented. And, um, you know, it, whether it's actually appointment television at 10 o'clock straight up, yeah, there, there might be some change to that in the future, but, but not in the near future. I, I got an email from a friend uh, just this morning, as a matter of fact, that, that I forget what exactly was, but said the, the DC station, I found this kind of hard to believe, but said that the DC station doesn't have a sports anchor anymore. Mm. They, they just, they read a couple of stories. Um, you know, their, their news anchors will cover the, the so-called big stories. And then they have like a sports reporter who might do a, a story, but they don't have a guy uh, or a gal. They don't have a, a main anchor who, who is doing a, a three, four minute segment on local sports. And a lot of stations around the country have started doing that. Um, I don't know if they've gone back to it, but years ago, I mean, this was, this was several years ago. The station I used to work at KNTV in Omaha, they dropped, their sports anchor. And I'm thinking KNTV in Omaha with the Huskers. Yeah. They don't, they don't have a sports anchor, but they just kind of absorbed it into the newscast and they, you know, they let the anchors read the occasional story. And, uh, and then they might have a, a person who is somewhat designated as a sports reporter and they kind of plug in some stories. I could see it maybe going that way someday. Uh, but I, but I, I think the Dallas market in particular is so strong with the Cowboys and the Mavericks and the Rangers and the Stars, the, the interest in college and uh, you know high schools. Obviously, uh, I, I don't I don't see how they ever do that without a uh, without a fully staffed sports department headed by a main sports anchor. And I I think it will be that way for for quite a while. The, uh, the, the, the guys, that the personalities, owners, players that you've covered over the years, especially in the Dallas market, who is, is it Jerry or is it Switzer? Could it be Cuban? Who do you feel like that engaged your opinion the most? Wow. Uh, probably Jerry. Um, I mean, depending on how you want to define, you know, my opinion, I, you know, I butted heads with all of them. I, I mean, I, I hated Switzer quite obviously. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I just thought he was an idiot and, and I think I was, I think I was proven right on that. What was really funny about the Switzer, uh, argument was I loved him when he was at Oklahoma. I mean, he, he was so media friendly. It was, it was actually amazing. I went up there to do a Texas OU preview one time and what was the kid Marcus Dupree was their great running back. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm standing on the sideline and he looks over at me and he goes, Hey, Hanson. I mean, I don't know why he knew me. I mean, this was years ago, but he, he said, hey, Hanson, you got everything you need. I said, well, you know, actually, uh, I didn't get Marcus Dupree because we were running around with, a, you know, it was just me and, and my buddy uh, Lee Gonzalez. And I, I said, we weren't able to get Marcus Dupree, but other than that, we're, we're good. He goes, oh, hold on. He goes, Marcus, come out. And he took Marcus off the practice field. Took him off the practice field in the middle of practice and says, here, go talk to Hanson. I mean, who does that? Then, and this is typical Switzer, he has Lee Gonzalez, my cameraman, playing middle linebacker. <laughs> and he had done this bit. He did this bit in, in, in Nebraska uh, when, when they were getting ready to play, or when Oklahoma and Nebraska were getting ready to play. And I had seen this bit, so I asked him to do it, and he did. We put our camera at middle linebacker, and we, we ran all the plays. 
And then Switzer looks up into the camera and he goes, hey, Fred, you know, Fred Akers. He goes, hey, Fred, uh, I've got Marcus Dupree running around the left end. I've got Marcus Dupree running around the right end. Sometimes I'm going to run him up the middle. Do you have anybody down there in Austin who can catch him? Mm. And it was staggering. I mean, the Texas fans went nuts. So when Switzer comes to Dallas to coach the Cowboys, Aikman, Troy Aikman says to me, Hanson, you're going to love this guy. He's crazy. And I said, no, no, I know Switzer. I said, he's fantastic with the media. I, I, I'm, I'm fine with this. I mean, I hated seeing Jimmy go, but I said, no, this is great. And then he just turned out to be the biggest jerk in the world, you know, and uh, that was the end of it. But, uh, uh, I mean, from a, from a heated, I can't stand the individual. Obviously, it was Barry Switzer. Uh, Cuban, we just kind of butted heads a few times, and he sent me a very nice email the other day. And, I, you know, I, I like Cuban. I, I, I respect him. And, and people, I think you know this, Smokey. I like Jerry Jones. I just hate the fact that he, that he thinks he's a general manager. I, I get a kick out of the guy, and I do respect the fact that no matter what I say about him, he keeps coming back for more. And I love that. I mean, I, I respect the heck out of anybody who does that. I've never seen a guy in, in such a powerful position who takes the, the shots and the arrows that he does, and you know this, he'll come right up to you and, you want me on your show tonight? What do you need? I'll be there. And they're like, how does he do that? Why does he do that? And, and I, I respect that. Now, I mean, I think he does it because he loves it, quite frankly. Uh, and, I, and I know for a fact that behind closed doors, he cusses my name and says a lot of really nasty things, you know. But uh, uh, I, 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 I like the guy. So depending on how you want to frame the question, I think Jerry Jones drives me as much and I have more fun and I love bagging on Jerry and interviewing Jerry and talking about Jerry, uh, Cuban, I've actually, I think started to, to develop a pretty good relationship and, uh, and Switzer is still an idiot. <laughs> does, that answer the, does that answer the yeah, question? Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it didn't surprise me the way you ended up with it either. Dale Hansen retiring in September, 50 years in radio broadcasting, 41 years in the Dallas and Fort Worth market. Paul, when you, Stop doing Cowboys games when that all kind of went down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did you think that you and Jerry would ever have a, a functional relationship again, given that, you know, you had you had been working for his team and then uh, in, in a regard and then he, you had, had crossed some sort of line with him in his mind? Yeah, no, that, again, I think that's kind of where, where my relationship with Jerry really did uh, actually grow in that regard. People for years said that all my criticism of Jerry Jones was because of the fact that I was no longer doing and, and being paid to do the Cowboys radio broadcast. It was just stupid. And I, and I think Jerry knew, knew that as well. I, I hated, I hated dealing with that nonsense for, for quite a few years. But, you know, as I kept saying, no, I said, my criticism of, of Jerry and the Cowboys is because they don't win anymore. I said, where was my criticism of, of the Cowboys in, in 1991, 92, 93, 94, 95? I didn't criticize the Cowboys then. I, I just didn't because there was nothing to criticize. But the fact that, that, that I'm off the radio broadcast and I'm really blowing up this football team on a pretty regular basis from 97, 98 into those lousy 2000 years with Dave Campo and all the rest of it. And yet Jerry would always pick up the phone when I called. Jerry would always uh, uh, answer uh, you know, the call that when I needed him on my show or Sunday nights or whatever. Uh, and we even had the occasional beer together in Wichita Falls in the early 2000s. Um, yeah, I, that, that's about what I expected it to be. It went a little more downhill after that, and I hated that. But, but for the most part, um, you know, when Jerry sees me, he says hello. Uh, I say hello to him. Uh, I fully expect that if we go to California for a final trip or what, whatever we do, I, I expect him to do another interview with me. I'd be surprised if he didn't. But um, no, the relationship, I think the relationship is about what I thought it would be when I left the broadcast. It's not as friendly. It's not as open. It's not, you know, it's not nearly as cordial, all of those good terms. But it, it is exactly what I thought it would be. And, and I think, quite honestly, probably what it should be. Have you ever regretted an unplugged commentary or editorial? And is there one that you wish you would have done? 
Oh, there's a bunch of them I wish I would have done. No, I've never regretted. Uh, I, I've regretted a great number of things that I've said on the air over, you know, my 41 years in Dallas. But, no, I've never regretted a commentary because, uh, believe it or not, I, I, I do think about them before I go on the air. I mean, I, I, I read them to a lot of people. Uh, Joe Trahan was talking about this the other night. I mean, before I do a commentary, uh, if I have any questions about it, I run it through a lot of people for their, for their input. Um, uh, I'm not looking for their approval. I'm not looking for them to agree with me. Um, but I, I, I sometimes will have a line or something that I go, is this okay? You, you know, does that make sense to you? Um, but no, I've, um, I, I've never, uh, I've never done uh, a commentary on the air that I regretted um, uh, or that I felt bad about in any fashion because Fortunately or unfortunately, um, I only write what I believe. This is what always kind of annoys me as well. Uh, I haven't gotten this for several years, but I used to hear a lot. Uh, well, you, we know you don't believe that, but, but that liberal Channel 8 management, they wanted you to say that. We know you didn't have any choice. And I'm like, really? I mean, that's what you really think? I mean, no, I said, I'm not Skip Bayless here. I only write it if I believe it. Yeah. I mean, that's the, I mean, that's the bottom line. <laughs> and I, I, which probably scares some people, but I, I've never, um, I've, I've, no, I've never written anything um, uh, that I that I feel like I should apologize for in a, in a commentary, in an unplugged commentary, because those are so incredibly important to me. Uh, that That's what's been driving me for about eight, nine years, quite honestly. That's, that's where my real passion for, for the business comes from is writing the commentaries. And, uh, uh, as far as anything that I haven't written, no, um, um, you know, I, I did write a piece the other day, a while back rather, um, about the voting rights changes that are being made, uh, in so many States around the country. Um, and it, it didn't get on the air for a lot of different reasons. Uh, I, I'm doing this Davy Blast show and, uh, you know, I, I kind of wish I'd have done that one. I, I, I wish I'd have pushed a little harder to do that one, but, uh, but, but not any, not any major regrets about it. It's just, um, it's kind of the nature of, of the beast. And, um, uh, but that would be, that'd be about the only, only thing I could think about because, you know, unfortunately in the minds of a lot of people, uh, David, I, I, I've kind of written about a lot of stuff mm-hmm. you know? and, uh, and there's, there's, there's more people out there that wish I would shut up about some of my commentaries than, than, than for me to do more. And, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the body of work at the end of the day. I really am. Which of these two, one launched you into another stratosphere, the SMU story, but what about the commentary that landed you on Ellen and her show? Which of those two was a bigger rocket booster? Oh, I, I think Michael Sam without question, the, the Michael Sam commentary. The, the, the SMU story um, – I think the SMU story put me into a different level uh, in the way people perceived me, and, and I changed. Um, in, in my so-called farewell address, uh, I, I, I do talk about this, is that my life changed. Um, people forget this, but, but I was a cheerleader. I, when I came to Dallas in 1980, and certainly when I started in, in Omaha, Nebraska in 1977, I was a cheerleader for the Huskers. Um, uh, I, mean, I mean, there wasn't anything really to criticize on the one hand in those days. Um, but I mean, I, I went to the games, uh, Smokey, with, you know, the white sweater, uh, uh, you know, the red pants. I had the, the little hat with a feather on the side. You know, the first game I ever went to, uh, the great, great Danny Livingston said to me, uh, did you just leave the polka contest? <laughs> and I'm like, you know. I said, no, but I, I was bowling all night. This was, you know, <laughs> and uh, uh, even when the Huskers came, they played Houston in the Cotton Bowl in, in 19, uh, uh, what was it, 1980, uh, I had red pants on, white sweater. You know, I'm, I'm cheering on the sideline. And then I, I pretty much did the same thing when I came to cover the Cowboys in 1980. I, mean, I remember I was insane. I'm very embarrassed to talk about this now, but I think it's kind of the maturation of, of, of me as an individual and as a reporter. I'm in St. Louis and Tony Dor- in the press box and Tony Dorsett scores a touchdown on a great run, uh, late in the game to, 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 to win the game. And I'm, I'm, I'm cheering like hell. I'm, I'm jumping up and down like, Oh my goodness. This guy, I'll never get this guy looks at me. He goes, Hey buddy, buddy, 
are you a journalist or are you a cheerleader and I, or a fan? And I said, yes. Yes, I am. <laughs> you know, I'm so, here to cover the game, but I'm a fan. You and started I for that. several years. I, I, was, I was a fan. I, I wore my cowboy hats and I'm, you know, I'm making bets with other sportscasters around the country. And, oh, you can't beat the Cowboys. Oh, you're never going to beat the Cowboys. And, and then the SMU story, quite frankly, changed all of that. It, it changed everything I believed about college athletics and, and athletics in general. And then I started looking at all sports with more of a jaundiced eye because, you know, that was also, if you remember, right during the height of, of uh, uh, you know, Dallas Carter being suspended from the playoffs and, and, and all the cheating in Texas with no pass, no play, and all of that. All of that. Um, and it changed me. But there wasn't social media. I, I was actually, they did a feature story uh, uh, on us in Sports Illustrated. They had our picture in Sports Illustrated. And uh, I, did get a, I did get a very nice award. And I'll never forget this moment. Uh, I get the DuPont Columbia Award uh, in New York City. And the great Bill Moyers introduces me. And this banquet was being carried live on PBS. And I'll never forget, Bill Moyers says to this room full of award-winning journalists, if you're not from Texas, you have no appreciation for what this man and this station did. And it, it, oh, I mean, it just gave me chills. And I walk up to accept the award and uh, Ted Koppel is sitting there applauding and Tom Brokaw is sitting there applauding and Bill Moyers, I got a picture on my wall in my office here at home. Bill Moyers is shaking my hand. Um, but even then it was like, yeah, okay, you're the guy that did the SMU story. Here comes Michael Sam in 2014. And now I'm on the Ellen show. Now I'm on, I'm being interviewed by the New York times. I'm being interviewed by the Washington post. Uh, I'm being interviewed on, on almost every radio station in America. I'm, I'm being interviewed uh, on CNN. Uh, Nightline had me on. Uh, you know, I mean, it just, because of social media, it, it, that I, I will be, to me, the defining moment of, um, uh, of taking me to a level that I, I never, ever dreamed uh, possible in my life. It just... Uh, that's who I want to be remembered as, you know, if somebody walks by and says, Hey, they see a marker in the ground or some nonsense. And, you know, did you ever see what that man did about human rights? Did you ever see what that man said about civil rights, domestic violence, gay rights in America? Did you ever hear that man talk about that? You know where, where he was? Because I, I absolutely believe I'm on the right side of history. And that's how I want and hope people uh, remember me if, if, if they remember me at all. Dale, you have time for two or three more questions? I've got all the time you want. I'm basically yeah. retired. Yeah, okay, <laughs> Paul. It, it's interesting you mentioned the SMU story making you look at sports with a jaundiced eye. I, I, uh, I'm always curious to hear that from from people. I, you know, when we covered the Baylor story here, I was yeah. covering the, the Sam Ukawachu, the rape trial, and that, like, walking out of that on the last day, I mean, I've never been, I've never looked at things the same way again. And I, I, I wonder, for you, what was the key to kind of also, because it took me a little bit to get my enjoyment back of, of watching sports and not going, well, there's something crappy going on here. What yeah, was the key yeah, for well, you to coming back uh, on that and, 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 and wrapping your arms around enjoying it too? Well, I, yeah, I, I don't enjoy it the way I used to. I mean, I never have enjoyed it the same way. But at, it, it enabled me, I think, to be a much better reporter. Um, I, I think it enabled me to be uh, a more critical eye, which, which I understand some fans don't like. I get that. But I really do believe that I have an obligation to tell you how bad the Cowboys really are when they're bad. I have an obligation to tell you how bad the Rangers are when they're really bad. Uh, I, I, I don't cheer the teams like I used to. and I, I think that's healthy. I think it's a good thing. Um, but I, I don't sit down. The lovely Mrs. Hanson cheers like crazy for the Cowboys. She just loves the Dallas Cowboys. And when they lose, I'm walking out the door. She'll say, now, don't be too hard on them tonight. Don't be too hard on them. And she goes, because I know you enjoy this. I said, well, I don't really enjoy that either. 
but I do know it's a better story. I mean, when, when you could kind of point out how Jerry Jones wanted to draft Johnny Manziel, uh, that's a good story that I'm never going to let go. I mean, that's such a good story. Uh, but, but no, in answer to your bottom line question, I don't know how you can find that same enjoyment. It, I was talking about this just the other day with a friend of mine, and I said, I, I think this is true at every level of our business. And I think, and by that I mean like in news. I, I think I, I've talked to a lot of news reporters over the years who have I thought, boy, this is great. I'm going to cover the news and I'm going to bring it to the community. And then they, they really get into the inside of politics. They get into the inside of, of what is taking place in our country. What, what is happening in some police departments. Uh, and then they find out, wow, you know, there, there, there's a lot of really bad stuff going on here. Now, there's a certain satisfaction of exposing that. But I think for the most part, I, I, I didn't enjoy exposing the cheating at SMU. I didn't enjoy... Uh, talking about the, the issues going on at Baylor. I mean, uh, I, I I loved Art Bryles. I, I I had Art Bryles on my show. I I think he's a fantastic football coach. Uh, I used to like Dave Bliss for goodness sakes. But I I think because of SMU, I embraced it when I was being pushed to report on Dave Bliss, to report on Art Bryles, to report on whatever the issue might be. Um, but I I, I don't. I don't have the same pure, unadulterated fan uh, reaction that I used to have back in the day covering Nebraska. And I'm hoping, quite honestly, in retirement, maybe I'll, uh, maybe I'll get some of that back. Maybe I'll get some of that back. But I sit at home watching the Rangers games. I sit at home watching a Mavericks game or a Cowboys game or whatever, knowing that I've got to go to the office and break it down from a reporter perspective. And then that kind of takes a lot of the fun out of it. It's fun to report on it. I love that red light popping on. But sometimes I would just like to scream and holler and yell and cuss and laugh uh, just watching the game. And I haven't done that for uh, – I haven't been able to do that for 30 years. You say you like that red light coming on, which anyone in television knows what that means. And even in radio, we, we know when we're on. Do you yeah. feel like you hear about athletes, Dale, saying that they miss the roar of the crowd, the camaraderie? in the locker room. Is that something you've thought about? Oh yeah. 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 That, that, because this is that red light again, which is again, the, the light above the camera that tells you, Hey, you're on right now. If they don't understand, there cannot be uh, a better drug on the streets. There can't be uh, a better shot that you could get from a doctor to make you feel better than how I feel when that red light comes on. The flip side of that is, David, and I don't ever find this or not, even when I was doing radio for a while, uh, doing, and I was only doing an hour. I don't know how you guys do three, four hours at a time. But I, I was doing an hour on radio, and there's the same response. Once, once they point at me and say, you're on, man, I'm, I'm ready. I'm on. But I hate everything that surrounds it. And, and this is kind of what I feel in television right now. I don't want to walk upstairs and try to figure out how to jam this information into that three minute window I've got. Mm -hmm. Oh, I got to write something for the morning show. Oh my gosh. Uh, now I got to drive up 35 after shaving and I'm sick and tired of shaving. And, and 35 is, it looks like some of the missiles headed to Israel ended up on this, ended up in DeSoto for goodness sake. So they, somebody blew up 35 and you can't already drive to and from to Dallas anymore. And I just hate all of it. I mean, I hate all of it. And then that light comes on yep. and I'm like, yeah. And, and then I drive home, and I go, okay, we're not doing that much longer. I'm, you know, yeah. and, and I've had, unfortunately, that feeling, and I said this the other day as well, that's not fair to WFAA. That, that's not fair uh, uh, to, to the rest of the guys in my department. And, and quite honestly, it, I don't think it's fair to me. And the best, purest example of this, and I, I, I know, David, you can understand me on this, I was the guy that used to go to Cowboys training camp for the entire six weeks. Yep. I was there the entire six weeks. I covered every practice. I did interviews. I, I wrote many of my own stories. We did a 20 minute show every night of the week, except Saturdays, Monday through Friday, plus Sunday, we did a 20 minute special on that day's practice. And I loved it. I didn't like it. I loved it. 
and about the last three, four, five years, Sean Hamilton, our sports director, would come to me and said, "Okay, uh, when do you want to go to camp?" And I said, "Do I do I have to go?" Uh, okay, how about this? I'll, I'll go out Wednesday. We'll do Jerry Jones on Sunday, and how about if I come back Monday? Would that be okay? Uh, well, no, you know, we got to keep, okay, all right, I'll stay the week. I'll stay the whole week. And uh, that's not right. I mean, that, that's just not right. Um, I, you know, Mark Cuban sent me this note the other uh, yesterday, and he goes, well, maybe now that you're retired, uh, you'll actually come to a, a Mavericks game again. <laughs> and I said, well, now that I'm retired, I can't afford your ticket prices. You know, I said, I said will you honor an expired press pass? You know, no. and um uh, but, but I don't go to games because I used to go to every game over Reunion Arena. I'd go down there and watch the first half or, you know, see whatever. And now, well, I, I, and I said this to Mark several years back. I said, you, you know, they've invented this thing called television. I mean, I, I watch the Rangers games. I watch the golf tournaments. I, I watch uh, the, the Mavericks, you know. I, I, I said, I, I watch them on television. I just don't traipse over to the building and – park myself upstairs in a press box and sit there for a little bit. I, I just don't. And, uh, uh, you know, should I, I don't know, probably, but, but I don't, uh, as I jokingly say, I've got people to do that stuff for me, you know, but when it really hit me a couple of years ago that I've reached a point in my life and I, I feel almost kind of stupid saying this, but I reached a point in my life where I didn't want to go to California for six weeks in the summertime. Yeah. I'd rather stay in Waxahachie when it's 104 than go to California on the company dime. And I mean, that's, that's just wrong. I mean, that's wrong for everybody involved. And that's what I started thinking about, uh, you know, the, the, the exit point. And, uh, um, you know, and, and as I also said, for the last couple of years, it was hard for me to, to, to pull the, the, the rip cord because I needed to check. I wanted the check and, and working for a paycheck never works out well for me. It never has, nor have I ever worked for the check. The check has followed me for the most part. And I'm, I'm very appreciative that it has, but I feel sorry for, because most of my friends, they work for the check. Mm -hmm. They're pushing papers at the bank or pushing papers in the offices or whatever, because they need the check. I was lucky enough that, no, I don't have to work for the check. But the last couple of years I have been. And again, that's, that's just not fair to anybody involved. And now that I finally got my finances figured out where I think I'm going to be okay, uh, it's time for me to go. And if it turns out that I've miscalculated the numbers, um, I'll be the guy at Walmart telling you that hammers are in aisle seven. You know, uh, <laughs> Well, I have a lot of favorite stories, and I know we got to go, and, and, and we appreciate your time. But I can't forget the time in Austin. Aikman had his back surgery or whatever it was, and we're at a place called, like, Top of the Mark. And he was there yeah, with, yeah. His, with his the guy that monitored him, Mickey, you, me, and others, my brother-in-law, yeah. Tony. And we had a fun time. And the, yeah. che the check came. The lady brought the tab. Aikman threw down, like, a $100 bill. And you started on his ass about the fact, wait a minute, you just signed a five-year, $50 million deal. You remember, do, you, do you remember that at all? I think it all, but I think it was a $20 oh. bill, quite honestly. <laughs> uh, Aikman, Aikman is, is, is probably, it probably uh, if he's not number one of my all-time, all-time, all-time favorite guys, uh, it, 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 it's a short list. Let me put it that way. I, I love that man to death. I, he's done things for me. He's given me stories. Uh, he's traveled with me. We played golf together. He went back and spoke at my high school's graduation uh, back in the early 90s. The whole town went nuts. Um, but Aikman, I don't know how he had the career he did as a quarterback. Because when it comes to paying the check, he's got the shortest arms in America. <laughs> he's... I, I I love it to death, but he's got the shortest arms in America. Mm -hmm. And uh, but yeah, no those um, th those those times were were staggering. I mean, uh, uh, they they were and again that was kind of the relationship I I, I could have with Aikman. I, I mean, and I've had it with you know about ninety eight percent of the people that I've dealt with. 
most of them get it. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just having fun. I enjoy it. And I, I you know, Daryl Johnston reached out to me the other day and, uh, you know, I, I, Rick Carlisle, the Mavericks coach called me uh, yesterday and, uh, you know, they get it. You know, I mean, I, I have a job here. I mean, you know, unfortunately in some cases, my job is to say that you're really bad. And, uh, at the same time, I don't care. I mean, it's not personal to me. It's never, it's never been personal. I've had, and, and the only reason I feel comfortable about this, Smokey, and, and I and I hope you know this. I mean, Ed Bark used to write some incredibly negative reviews of my work in the early days. I mean, he he was incredibly hard on me, and he called me one time, and and I answered the phone, and I'm I'm answering his questions. And he said, have you ever read anything I've written? I said, I've got everything you've written in my desk drawer. I mean, I, I read everything. And he goes, but you always take my calls and you always answer my questions. And I said, well, yeah, that, that's your job. Your job is to critique me. And I don't like that you said this. I don't like that you said that. Uh, but but that's your job. I don't care what you write. I, I, I don't care what you say. I, I know who I am. Uh, and then most athletes, I think, get that. Unfortunately, not all of them get that. Uh, and most coaches, and, you know, like I said to Mark Cuban one time, why would you possibly care about what I say? You're Mark Cuban, for goodness sakes. You're Mark Cuban. There's nothing I can say that's going to change Mark Cuban's life. So why would you be upset? And uh, I, for the most part, have been able to take the criticism and just kind of laugh about it and say, yeah, okay, the check's still cleared. I can... I can still have fun. I, I don't take it personally. When it crosses that line, some of the emails that I've gotten over the years, they do cross that line and they do get personal. And I don't take those particularly well. Um, but I've, I've had a lot of critics and, uh, uh, and, and I respect that I go right back to Jerry Jones. For the most part, for the most part, he accepts the criticism and then does his job. Um, I respect the heck out of that. I mean, I respect the heck out of that. And, and some people find that hard to understand, but uh, uh, because again, not all of them do. Not all of them do. Dale, we appreciate it. Yeah, I consider you, uh, I haven't seen you much the last few years, a great friend. You were there for me during some very difficult times. You hosted those parties in Waxahachie. Craig was a part of that. The family is a part of it. They're incredible. Congratulations. I hope to see you at Cowboys training camp. When it's the well, time you're you know, there. Probably, I, I think I've tried to avoid you ever since you talked me into playing that golf game against that, that pro down in San Antonio. Oh, and we yeah. lost all that oh, money. Oh, you know, yeah. I, oh, yeah. yeah. Ever, ever since then, I realized you really don't understand how to bet on a golf course, and I'm done with you. I'm done with you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and thanks for the time I was able to play Dallas National, which was a great treat. Oh, Thank man, you. It was good. Well, I, I, I plan on, I hopefully, I mean, again, depending on all the protocols and, you know, how this stupid COVID thing works out. But uh, I, I, I'm planning on, at least our plan is to make a final trip to uh, – to uh, uh, California and a final interview out there, hopefully, uh, you know, with Jerry and, and, uh, and, and then probably we'll, um, we'll swing over to BJ's and I'll pick up one more tab and then we'll call it a day. I can't wait. Thanks, Dale. Appreciate